podcast. Um, today, I'm very excited because I will talk about my brand new book, and I actually have finally received a copy of it, uh, my new book, Tech Trends in Practice. And what I want to do uh, over the next five weeks or so is to look at each of the tech trends that I discuss in my book and give you uh, an outline and also um, allow you to ask as many questions as you want. Um, feel free to always submit them beforehand. I always have this out on my LinkedIn channel and I've had a, I've received quite a few questions already, which is great. But also feel free to ask uh, questions in this live stream, use YouTube, use LinkedIn. Um, what I will do is I will go and have a look afterwards and make sure I will try to answer as many questions as possible. So even if we don't get to answer all your questions, we we will I will do my best to answer all of them. Let me just see uh, enter the the live stream now to see where we are. So I see all your questions. So today, as I said in my in my book, which is called Tech Trends in Practice, the the twenty five technologies that are driving the fourth industrial revolution. Today, I want to focus on uh, just five of those trends, and those five are big data, they are artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, wearable devices, and intelligent spaces or smart cities and smart buildings. So I will look at all of these five in turn and give you a flavor of what I see uh, as some of, the, some of the key trends, and then hopefully we'll have a, a really good discussion about this too. Um, Okay, let me see. We've got uh, a few thousand people live already. I'm so pleased. The last uh, four streams I did all had over 20,000 people live on it on LinkedIn alone. So I'm super excited about this. And I'm just seeing, okay, we've got a good amount of people. I believe we've got about 4,000 people right and right now we're waiting for a few more to come on as i said feel, feel free to ask any questions let me know um what you think feel free to comment share and also let me know where you're from so i just have a quick look Assad from saudi hello very good to see you i've got jet mira from albania i've got hamad from nigeria uh, April from Texas and Dilip from India is uh, and Narish from India as well from Hyderabad. So when I what I suggest I do is I give you an overview of some of these um, key technology trends and then we will hopefully have a really good Q and A afterwards. So. The book is called The 25 Tech Trends That Are Driving the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So the first question is, what is, why are we talking about a fourth industrial revolution? And um, I am a regular contributor to the World Economic Forum. And when business leaders get together in Davos, Switzerland to discuss um, the, the latest business and economy trends, their founder, Professor Klaus Schwab, has to has talked about this fourth industrial revolution now for the last few years. So just to give you a flavor that why are we talking about this fourth, basically we've seen three previous industrial revolutions and they've all completely changed how businesses operate and they've all been driven by technology. So the very first industrial revolution now a long time ago around 1770 was when we suddenly invented water and steam or we didn't invent this but they we invented machines that could leverage water and steam. So we could we saw people move from farms to the first kind of manufacturing plants. Um, they uh, and then about 100 years later, in 1870, we've seen the industrial realization. So we um, we suddenly had, an, had we, we invented assembly plants and we had mass productions driven by electricity. And this really started the industrialization across the world. 
The next one, again, another 100 years or so later, around the mid 1900s, uh, uh, so around 1970 or so, we had one driven by computers early on, productivity around electronics, and we saw a lot of blue color worker and, and seeing their, their jobs being automated. What we are seeing now and this in this new industrial revolution is that we are seeing technology trends like the internet of things like artificial intelligence like big data that are driving some of the white color automation so what i want to do is is now talk about the first five of those trends and give you a flavor of, of what they are and what they mean for businesses um let me just see who else is on the stream. We've got um, Salem from Pakistan. Hi, really good to see you on the stream. Um, so the first trend I want to talk about is big data. And I believe that big data is really this the fuel or this new oil for this industrial revolution. We have seen a massive trend towards digitization. So more of our business processes, more of what we do day in and day out involves now digital components, involves computers. And whenever there's a digital component, it means it produces data. And we are now generating more data than ever before. And the amount of data we have in the world is basically exploding. So this is why I talk about the, the the data explosion in the world and data comes from so many different sources we have data generated from our devices like our mobile phones we generate data whenever we go on social media when we search the web and um, currently in the entire world we're generating around two and a half quintillion bytes of data this is a number with 18 zeros on it. So a massive amount of data. And this we're adding this every single day. When we write our 300 billion emails, we take 3 billion photographs. We, I think, over one and a half billion people go on Facebook every single day. And whatever we do, whatever we, oh, most of our activities now leave this digital trace. And currently we have around, 30 zettabytes of data. So a zettabyte is crazy. It contains a sextillion uh, bytes. To make this more real, most modern computers have a terabyte of data. And uh, one single zettabyte means uh, about a billion terabytes. So we have 30 billion terabytes of data in the world at the moment, and this will grow to over 175 zettabytes by 2025. So we're seeing this massive explosion. And, and again, if we try to stack all of those data points and put them on a DVD, which contains a lot of information, right? And we stack this up, it would actually be, we would be able to have a stack that goes 222 times around the world. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of the scale. It's something unprecedented. We've never had all of this data. And what is interesting is that at the moment, only a tiny fraction maybe less than 1% of all the data that we are generating is actually used, let alone analyzed in any meaningful way to help us in our businesses. So what we now have is a world where we can um, store unlimited amounts of data almost uh, in, in cloud storage solutions, and we can analyze this in real time, again, using cloud and distributed computing. So this has taken away lots of the barriers that companies had in the past where they said, actually, we don't really have the infrastructure, the technology, um, and the capabilities in place to store and use all of this data. Nowadays, you can. So this is, for me, the fuel and what this big data enables organizations to do is that we can now make much better decisions. We can inform our decision making using data and we can use this data to better understand customers and understand their trends and make, make predictions. And we can um, use this data to come up with more intelligent products or even bring some of this data collection um, intelligence into our products and services. 
So this brings me nicely to my next trend, which is the Internet of Things or IoT. And this basically means that we now have more connected devices that are capable of collecting and transmitting data. So they're connected to the internet and they're able to, to collect and transmit and process data. And again, currently we have something in the region of um, 30 billion connected devices in the world. If you think about your smartphones, your TVs, your watches, and so on. But soon we will see smart everything. So that again, these 30 will grow to over 200 billion connected devices. Compare this to the just 7 or 8 billion people we have in the world. So maybe 50, if not more, devices per person that we could see in the future. And we will see connected clothes, we see connected uh, devices like um, even a connected diaper or, or nappy, as we call them here. Um, you now have a connected nappy that will let you know that your baby have de has deposited something in it and you need to change it. But again, what is happening in the future, what lots of companies are working on is that these become truly smart because telling you that your baby has done something in, in the nappy or the diaper is not the most sophisticated things because I guess we all have other sensors to tell us that this is happening. So what is um, going to happen in the future is that they can have chips in them that analyze whatever urine or poo or whatever the baby deposits into the nappy. And this can then be analyzed. So it will be sent to your phone by Bluetooth. Your phone will send it the, over the internet to a server where this can be analyzed in real time, taking a complete analysis. And, it's, and they are even able to make predictions. So there are some algorithms now already available that can predict infections in babies about 48 hours before any physical symptoms appear. So this for me shows the power of the Internet of Things in the future for healthcare, for lots of other things. I now use a connected toothbrush and my toothbrush, again, has in sensors in them, it collects data and it will tell me, have I brushed enough? Have I missed any parts in my mouth? And we even have intelligent toilets um, Cola has recently released the smart first smart toilet that has a um, is, has Alexa built in, so you can ask your toilet to read you the news. Um, but interestingly, they are also working on sensors that can analyze whatever you put into the toilet and then make predictions very similar to the smart nappy that I was just talking about. So potentially. In the future, you just go into the, to the toilet in the morning and the, your toilet will, will tell you that your health is OK, or it might even make an appointment for you to see your doctor if something is not OK. Um, so we have and for companies, this has real implications, too, where we now have pre, this built in the centers built into machinery on even bigger equipment. So I've worked with. Kony, the world's largest, or one of the world's largest elevator and escalator manufacturer. And they're now connecting all of those lifts and all of the elevators to the internet. They're collecting data and they're now using this for predictive maintenance. So they can now see how people are using their product. They can predict that one of them might be breaking down. And this is changing the kind of service relationships they have with their customers. So instead of just selling them a product, they're selling them a, a service, moving people up and down buildings. And is that now their responsibility to make sure that these will never break down and they're collecting data. So one of the data points they're collecting is the vibrations on the cable, because this is an indicator that the motor that is pulling the elevator up and down might be breaking down at some point in the future. So the vibrations get stronger. They will sense this. They can repair them when no one is in the building to make sure uh, the service continues. So this is another massive big trend. Um, I've see, I'm seeing lots of people on the stream here. Jasmud, um, Bahia, hello, Marie um, from Manila, Jerry from Chicago, uh, hi, Shati from India. Um, we've got someone from South Africa, uh, Maurizio from Brazil, um, Hanil from from South Africa. So it's really good to see you all on this 
stream, feel free to ask questions. Um, just been asked for some banking examples. That's a, a, I will come back to some of those questions in a minute. Again, so the second trend was the Internet of Things. The third trend I talk about in the book is wearables and augmented humans. So we've had wearable devices for a very long time. If you think about glasses that we're wearing, so we, we can see very well, we now have glasses that can fix that or contact lenses. And what we are now doing is we're simply making those devices smarter. Now, nowadays we have not only smart watches that track our heart rate, but we have smart jewelry that can track our body functions. We have smart clothes that we can wear. So for example, uh, Ralph Lauren has now created a connected shirt that is made of connected fibers. And those shirts are connected to your mobile phone by a little sensor. And it will give you feedback on your exercise and will tell you which muscles you have um, exercised well in the gym or there's a company called super which is has produced a is producing a smart bra um, again this has a heart rate sensor inbuilt and companies like google and levi's are now working together on a smart denim jacket so what we are now seeing is that all of these devices are becoming smarter and some of them will improve our mental and physical performance and hopefully make our lives better and help us to live healthier and better lives. And if you think about this, the, the current Apple Watch, for example, has been um, graded as a medical device by the, by the FDA in America. And that means that it can take your heart rate, it can measure it, it can identify any abnormalities in your heart rate, and it can even suggest that you see a doctor to have this fixed. So again, we are moving to this predictive health scenario where jewelry and watches and clothes can even tell you that something might be wrong with you. And we have also things like an exoskeleton. I don't know whether you've seen this. They are basically robotic helpers that we strap on there like vests and they help us in manufacturing environments so companies like ford and volkswagen are now using them on their assembly plants because especially if you're working overhead if you have a robotic robotic helper that helps you to to move your muscles it's much less strenuous and you can work much smarter um Companies like Optometrics, for example, what they're now doing is they have they are working on a bionic uh, lens that is basically implanted into your eyes. So it's folded up and they perform a quick painless procedure where they implant this into your eye where this then unfolds and it gives you the perfect vision. So it's like having your glasses impl Im uh, implanted within your eye. And other companies like Google and Samsung are now working on smart contact lenses that potentially could give you amazing vision. In the future, they could give you night vision. They can give you much better superhuman vision. Um, they can even take photographs. The one that Samsung has developed can already do that. And the one that Google was working on was actually also measuring the glucose level in your tear liquid, because this can tell you if, you're, if you have diabetes, for example, that you need to regulate your insulin. And in the past, we had to inject ourselves or, or control our diets really tightly. Nowadays, you can implant an insulin pump into your body, and that can theoretically speak to your contact lens in order to regulate your your blood sugar levels and then we have things like mind reading technology so i believe that at some point in the future and this is already happening for me step by step that we'll merge humans with machines and if you think about this if you have diabetes you can now have a an implant of an insulin pump. If you have a faulty heart valve, you can have this replaced. If you have um, a, a motorcycle accident, for example, and you lose an arm, we can now have a bionic arm, a prosthetic arm. And the latest ones, we are able now to control with our brain. So you have a little, little sensor that 
measures your brain activities and you can learn to control this with your brain. So this is something that's going to happen more and more, this whole computer brain interface and companies like, like Google, like the MIT, like Facebook, and even Elon Musk are now working on this. And Elon Musk is looking at this Neuralink brain computer interface. And Samsung is working on, on uh, sorry, Facebook is working on technology to read our mind. So lots of mind blowing stuff happening there. Um, Francisco from Indonesia. Hi, hello. Good to see you on the live stream. Dr. Kuna from the UAE. Um, we have got Chanel. Hi, um, Ali. Really good to see you, Murali. We've got Kenna from Nigeria, really good to see you. As I said, feel free to comment, ask questions, share if you want to have any more information on any of these trends. So my, my third trend was wearable devices and augmenting humans. The, the fourth trend, which for me is actually the most powerful trend trends of all, is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And for me, what is artificial intelligence? Sometimes we talk about artificial intelligence and we have this idea in mind that we get these artificial robots that will kill all of us on the planet and take take over. What we've had now, we've had artificial intelligence for a very long time. And basically what it is, is that we're using data to inform decision-making, but instead of informing our own decision-making, the computers will, will make those decisions based on data. And we've had this for the last 50 years. The only thing that we didn't have is we didn't have all of the data available. Now that we have big data and this massive explosion in the amount of data available, we can now use modern artificial intelligence algorithms. So they are basically just computer programs that are fed by data. And in the past, those artificial intelligence algorithms were a bit like a bit like expert systems where you said okay take this data point put this into this formula if all of this is if this is yes if this is no then you come up with the answer yes or no or one or zero or whatever so this worked very well if i had to say okay i want to recognize um a letter and we scan the letter and then say if the pixels are in this order this looks like an a if the pixels are in this order it looks more likely to be an f and then the computer basically guesses it and this is how you get machine vision and um and recognition of writing we've had this again for the the last 30 years or so, the US Postal Service has been using scanners that are basically driven by artificial intelligence for since the, 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 the 1970s, 1980s. Where uh, machines struggled in the past is that there are lots of things where we can't easily explain the rules. So I can explain the rules of how I recognize an A or B or C, right? What I can't rec uh, easily explain is how do I recognize my brother on a photograph? How do I know that someone is happy or unhappy? How, do I, how, how am I able to walk and swim and speak this language? All of these things are really complex and they are what we call tacit knowledge. So we don't actually understand them. We have picked them up through experience and we can't actually express the rules. So if I wanted to write a program that recognizes someone on, on a photograph that I know and then understands whether this person is happy or not, I can't easily write a computer program for this. What we now have is what we call machine learning, where we basically simply give machines lots of data. So for example, if you wanted a machine to distinguish between a dog and a cat, we simply give the machine millions of photographs of cats. And luckily on the internet, we have got lots of them. And we also give them millions of images of a dog. And then basically say, you figure out the difference and you figure out what how you would distinguish the difference between a cat and a dog. And this is a bit like what we do. We can't actually explain how we do this in our brain, but we are 
able to do this because we, we've learned this from experience. And this is now giving machines so much power because they can use the, the data and they can use all the intelligence and all the, all the computing power that we now have available to use this data to come up with their own ideas of decision making, which means machines can now read. So artificial intelligence enables machines to read. We now have a, something called the summarize bot. I can give it white papers and books and articles, and this algorithm will summarize the key insights for me. We therefore have the ability to write as well. So not only read, but write. So I write for Forbes, but algorithms, AIs also write for Forbes. So lots of the analyst reports are now automatically generated by machines. Um, the same is true for the, 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 the New York Times and the Washington Post. They are, are increasing, an increasing amount of articles is now generated by machines. Um, AI enables machines to see. So we have machine vision and things like facial, facial recognition. So if I pick my phone up and it allows me to enter without putting my thumb on or putting a password in, this means machine vision. So I've got artificial intelligence on my phone. Machines can hear. We now have detectors that can detect gunfires and they're now being included in smart street lights so police forces around the world can simply subscribe to this service and those smart street lights will detect that a gunshot has been fired because there are multiple uh, street lights around the area they can triangulate the exact location when and where a gun has been, fi been fired and they are now working on other noises like traffic accidents and other things too AI enables machines to smell. We now have um, computers that can detect smells in human breath to de detect that they might be ill. Or we have the ability of uh, computers in warehouses to in sensors to detect that a banana might go rotten. And if one of the bananas goes rotten, the gases spread very quickly, which can then spoil entire uh, truckloads of fruit. And again, they now have early warning systems in place to get rid of those uh, rotten bananas. Um, machines can now understand emotions in, on our pictures and our videos, and they can even play games. We've had this for a long time. We've had IBM um, with Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov in, in chess. Um, we, then we had IBM Watson that won the, the game show Jeopardy. And nowadays we have... Uh, companies like Google's DeepMind that have created an AI that can beat the professional players of the strategy game StarCraft II. So this is no mean feat. We now have our AIs that can play Mahjong, they can poker, they can play Go. All of these games that previously people thought was completely impossible. And machines can even debate now. One of my favorite examples is the project Debater, another IBM project, where they basically give a computer a topic and this computer then competes against a professional human debater so they both go off do their research on the internet the machine will do this completely independently then construct its own arguments speak and and basically present this to an audience react to the other debater and then have a proper argument and debate on stage, which for me blows my mind. So this obviously has huge implications for healthcare, for education, and for any other business across the world. Um, let me just see what's happening on the live stream. It's really good to see so many. Um, I will go through some of the questions later, but just drop them here. Um, so we talked about AI and machine learning as my fourth trend. The fifth trend is um, intelligent spaces or smart buildings and smart cities. So intelligent spaces and places. And what we're now seeing is that all of these internet connected devices are enabling us to create smart homes, smart offices, smart buildings that are able to control lighting, the climate control, access control, using things like um, 
face recognition and and other things so for example in dubai the the burj khalifa the the tallest building in the world um they are using huge amounts of sensors to automate the entire building from its heating to climate control to lighting to everything else and then even on a bigger scale, you then get smart cities where we have all these smart buildings. We've got sensors in the street lights um, and they are able to monitor traffic conditions. They are able to monitor rubbish collections. They're able to monitor um, basically everything that's going on. So companies like Alibaba in, in, in China, they've developed the city brain, which is um, uh, an artificial intelligence enabled tool that enables cities to be automated and managed through the data and sensors that, that they now have. And, and cities like Singapore, Amsterdam, and here in Milton Keynes, where I live, they are all thriving to become smart cities that will leverage all of this technology. Hi, Emilio from the Netherlands. Um, so what I want to do now is to spend a bit of time uh, answering some of your questions. I'm just looking through this, the, the stream here to see. Um, uh, I'm just copying these across. So I've had one question uh, from Sukurita from India and you are asking what could be some some real use cases for the internet of things and wearables in the banking space so that's a, a very good question and for me smart watches are the 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 ultimate example because i now use my smart watch to to make contactless purchases so i contactless pay using things like or using um services like apple pay and alipay so I can now make purchases simply using my watch. And for me, this is just the beginning because what will hopefully happen in the future is that we have more intelligent banking apps. At the moment, most of the banking apps are pretty stupid because they, they have, banks have so much information about what I'm buying, where I'm buying, possibly what some of my goals are in terms of saving up for a, a mortgage or saving up for a car or what or or whatever um if we have really intelligent apps that know where i'm going and i can then say okay i'm i'm now trying to save money for the weekend i want to have at least 50 dollars in my bank account by friday the watch can then help you achieve this because if it realizes you're now walking into a Starbucks coffee to spend $3 on a, on a cup of coffee, it might say, actually, do you really want to do this? You've told us that your goal is to save a bit of money for the weekend. Maybe you, you, you don't do this. So for me, there are really interesting dynamics of, and for me, contactless pay is the first starting point, but really smart services is the future. And for me, um, wearables are enabling all of this. Um, okay. Let me copy this across here. We have a question from Penny from England saying, with the rise of the Internet of Things and smart devices, how can we protect our privacy so good to see you again penny um so that for me what we need to do is we need to approach this a bit intelligently so i try to make my house as smart as possible but i also try to do this as safely as possible so a few tips i have here and i, I believe in the future this will all be managed better because at the moment we've got companies like apple and google building smart home platforms and i believe that they will be the interface and they will build in some of the security so they will make sure that any compliant system is up to date complies with regulation and so on but until we have all of this i think there are a few simple tips we can follow so in my in my my home for example i set up a a secondary network with my router that just works on my internet connected devices like my nest thermostats my cameras and so on um, then i use a really strong password for my internet router and i also make sure that the passwords i use on all devices so some of the devices in the past came with a default password like one 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 or zero 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 
if this is the case, anyone can break into these and usually they can then attack your entire network with this. So strong passwords, change default passwords, um, use something like a password manager to, to manage all of them. Make sure your devices are updated regularly because they always issue new patches and make sure you buy them from trusted vendors that you believe that follow regulation and best practice. They are for me some of the, the, the key tips here. Um, hi, Marilyn. Um, hi, David. Really good to see um, David saying Waze is a good example of manipulating inputs and outputs. Yeah, to some extent, you're absolutely right. Hamid, hi. Um, how BI can help with cyber attacks? Yeah, this is absolutely true for me. A really good question, uh, Hamid. What I'm seeing is that some of these platforms that Apple and Google will develop will have similar intelligence to what we now see in big data centers or even corporate IT systems, because corporate IT systems are now made more intelligent by using, um, let me just go back here to the right page. They're using more intelligent software applications that actually leverage artificial intelligence. So if you think about this, your networks in your company, if you monitor them for months, you see these person, these people are logging on from home, they're downloading files. This all looks pretty normal. And suddenly, someone from somewhere is downloading, is accessing files that they've never accessed, they're downloading some of those files. Artificial intelligence algorithms can detect these abnormal, abnormal, abnormal behaviors really quickly and then say, actually, let's shut this down. Let's have another security check in here to make sure no one is stealing our data or is accessing private information. And I believe that our homes will have similar tools in the future, leveraging some of these platforms. Um, let me just copy this question across here. Uh, I have a question from Laura from New York. Um, you have a question from one of your coaches saying she's worried about choosing a career that will that will be eliminated in the future. I feel that I've been hearing we're going to lose all our jobs my entire life, but only seen the rise of more but uh, of more and different jobs. Um, so what would you say to a young person choosing a career um, with this fear in mind? And I, I think you answered your own question already. This is exactly what I believe. I believe that um, technology is changing our world, but we have seen these changes all the time. And the, in the, at some point we had in the previous industrial revolution, when we had horses on the road, being a, a, someone that, that looks after horses and makes horseshoes was a very great, very good job. This obviously disappeared in the same way at some point when we started to use lifts and elevators, we had a person in them, the elevator operator to ask us what level we want to go to, then technology made this safer and we could ride elevators by ourselves. And I believe the same is happening now. What I'm seeing is that jobs will be augmented. So most of our jobs um, are going to change. There was a good study by, um, by the University of Oxford. And I've actually um, interviewed Carl Benedict Fry, one of the co-authors. The study is called The Future of Employment. That looked at, and you can actually see this on my channel. So if you head to my YouTube channel and look for The Future of Employment, you can see that video and can watch the, the interview with, with Carl, which I did uh, a few months ago. And what they were doing is they were looking at lots of different jobs around the world and say, how likely are they to be um, automated within the next 10 years or so? And interestingly, jobs like financial accountants and tax accountants were right at the top because what they what the study did is they looked at the jobs they were doing and then say how likely are or how easy is it for machines to take over this job. And if I look at my my own business, I remember my accountant turn up turning up in my office collecting all the receipts. Then she would give them to an assistant who would then put the receipts into a spreadsheet and then they would calculate my, my tax returns and so on. 
Nowadays, this is all automated. I simply have an app on my phone. I snap a photo of the receipt that I'm using. My uh, software will automatically use artificial intelligence to categorize this into the right spending uh, pockets. Um, I'm using automated account software. So a lot of their jobs is has been replaced, but at the same time, we're not seeing a huge amount of accountants completely out of jobs because they still need to do a job. They need to advise. And in the past, some of this administrative stuff was taking up a lot of their time. This is now going away and they can actually focus more time on the really value adding activities. So for me, um, what is key is that we focus on some of the really human skills. And I think there's Tao C from Ontario, Canada. You also say, could you suggest some skills and strategies as well as um, that, that, that make us more comfortable with these technological developments and help us remain uh, integrated and grounded? So thank you for that question, which I think links to Laura's question. Um, what I feel really strongly about is that we need to keep up to date with technology. This is actually one of the reasons I wrote uh, I wrote this book because I this is the book I always wanted to read saying what are the biggest the 25 biggest technology trends are really driving this new industrial revolution and how are they being used in business. So by understanding them, you are much better in a much better position to understand what this what the implications are for your own industry, for your own career. And then things like um, data literacy is still important. So a skill, because this will only become more important, that our ability to use all of this big data that we now have in the world to inform decision-making, make better decisions. But beyond this, I would focus on the real human skills because machines can now do so much. What they can't really do is they can't replace some of the true human skills at the moment. The, the ability to be creative is truly human. Machines can help us with this. And there's another chapter in my book on core creativity, which I'll discuss, I'll discuss in a few weeks time on, on, the, on a live stream. But creativity, emotional intelligence, interpersonal skills, things like communication, working in teams, understanding other cultures, so this cultural intelligence, all of these are vital skills. And if you focus actually on some of those, that will put you in a much better position. So think about this, the job I'm planning to do in the future, how likely are machines to do this? How easy is it for them to do that? And how many of those elements involve things like creativity, emotional intelligence, interpersonal thinking, critical thinking, cultural intelligence, collaboration with other human beings. If this is the case, then your career looks pretty safe. And what I see in most cases is that parts of those careers will get automated and replaced, but other parts won't. Hopefully that answers some of those questions. Um, as I said, I am going through uh, a lot of those questions that you have put in here. If I can't answer all of them, it's so nice to see you all engaging, saying hello. Um, let me just see. I've got a question here from Cyprus in India. Um, are we ready for drones to deliver packages? Um, are we ready for this to go mainstream? And this is interesting. So Cyprus from India, I don't know what is happening there exactly, but I, I'm very familiar with what's, what's happening in, in places like the US, here in Europe and in China. And I believe we are very much ready for this. Um, we ha I've actually written about a company called JD.com. They are one of the largest uh, retailers in China. And they have been using drones to deliver um parcels now for the last two or three years and they're clogging up millions of miles of drone um, flight deliveries every day so 
companies like Amazon are very real, very they're, they're very serious about this. They're trialing this currently in places like Germany and Australia and certain parts of the US. So what we need to do is we need to put some of the infrastructure in place. We need to make sure they have safe flight paths. Um, they're not cruising around airports and stuff like this. But I believe that we are getting very close to all of this. And and if you think about this, what's happening during this pandemic now, if I get a delivery, I don't sign for this anymore. The parcel gets, strapped, gets dropped on my, my doorstep. I get a ping on my app saying the parcel is here and a photograph with the, the, the parcel being delivered. A drone can do this as well as a person, if not better. So this should make companies even more resilient in, 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 in future pandemics. Um, um, hi, Dan from Nairobi, um, Fernanda from Brazil, really good to see you, um, Nevada, hi, good to see you, I've got Robin here from Chicago, thank you so much, um, let me see, any more questions, I've got one from uh, Muhammad from Pakistan, um, do you really uh, do we really need a different mindset to understand these technology trends like a, a higher level of of intellect maybe <laughs> that's a, a very good question uh, muhammad um what i i no i don't think we need a higher intellect what we need to do is some of the things that i talked about before just stay up to date with some of these technology trends um, understand what is happening. Being on, on this live stream is a very good starting point to start thinking about how does this impact my world, my career, um, my, my businesses. And then I believe in terms of mind um, said, I think business leaders need to really understand some of these technology trends. I now spend a lot of my time uh, in boardrooms with companies, helping them to understand what some of these technology trends mean for their business in terms of risks, in terms of opportunities. Um, and I still see businesses that are so far behind that are on their digitization journey. So they don't really quite understand what AI can now do, what tools like augmented reality can do, what digital twins can do, what how far autonomously driving cars have come. They are all trends I will talk about in, in future live streams and that are all um, obviously covered in my book. So being having leaders that are aware of this and then having this growth mindset in people i think this is the other challenge that you want everyone in your organization to see this as a, as a real opportunity to say actually i want to learn about new technologies i want to use these to innovate and and make this make our business better and make myself better and if you have this mindset that you want to continuously learn and develop, this is really critical. So for me, the mindset of actually being aware and and learning about these trends is absolutely key. And this whole idea of going to school, going to university, and then leaving university with all the skills you need for the rest of your career, this is out of the window. Nowadays, the half-life of your skills is dropping really rapidly. If you think about this, even five years ago, I wouldn't be sitting here talking about AIs that can smell and speak and read and and do all of these things. So what we need to do is we need to keep up to date with them and learn and and re envisage our businesses, re envisage our careers. Um, let me see some more questions. Chanel, very good to see you, Dawn. Hi, um, what advice would you give high schoolers who need direction for programs to pursue in college? Thank you, Dawn. Um, yes. <laughs> Again, I have I have three, ch three children and I continuously worry about giving them the right advice. Actually, the advice I give my own children and I'm also a governor of a, of a school. So I get to ask that question. I get people ask me that question on a regular basis. And my advice is actually going back to some of the skills I talked about earlier. If you are spending a lot of your time learning something where you learn facts and you 
you learn things by heart and they are, and you learn skills that machines can do better than you can, then maybe this is not the best career. So for me, what I recommend people do is the thing that they are really passionate about, where they can actually um, bring in creativity, critical thinking, their passion, their their emotional intelligence, interpersonal skills, all of these skills. If you find career paths that help you to grow those skills, at the same time helping you to better understand some of the latest technologies, then you are on a, in, in, a, in a good good place. So I work with lots of colleges. I'm currently advising a number of business schools. And what I find is that too few of them actually include some of the tech trends that we've just talked about in their program. Um, law schools, for example, how can you have a law school that teaches people to learn about all the laws and you have to learn all of the different legal things by heart and never talk about artificial intelligence and big data because there are now tools out there that simply are able to draw up contracts by themselves. So companies like Shell, one of my customers, they are now using contract gener generation tools. So their lawyers simply go over this to fact check this, but the contract is drawn up by an artificial intelligence tool. The same way contract checking, supplier onboarding, all of those things can now be done by machines. And, and there are now even apps out there that help you to go through a divorce process. <laughs> so the, the point I'm making here is that colleges need to make sure that they have an up-to-date curriculum. And whenever you choose a program, you need to make sure that they're actually aware and they're teaching all of these latest technology trends. So have a look through the 25 in my book. And if none, none of them are mentioned in the curriculum, then I would seriously question this. At the same time, focus on the humanities. The We need philosophers. We need lawyers. We need doctors to work alongside the machines to with machines to make our world a better place um Oremidi from paris hi very good to see you here um thomas from charlotte in north carolina really good to see you um this now brings my uh live stream to an end um as I said, I will spend some time over the next few days to go through the questions that you've posted. And they will also give me some really good information for future streams. So I will try to answer as many of them as possible. Um, other than this, thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I will see you again next week. I will post a, a time when I will do my next uh, live stream next week. And I will talk about the, the next five key trends that are included in my book. Hopefully you enjoyed this. See you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.